All right, I'm not fun. Okay, good morning. So we, we did by way of introduction last week looking at Sefer Shoftim Begadol, and now we're going to dive into the text. And a lot of textual similarities to the book of Yehoshua, but very different thematic content. So whereas Yehoshua came in and he succeeded Moshe Rabbeinu, and it started off that it was right after the death of Moshe Rabbeinu, and Yehoshua took over, and God spoke to him, and God told him, you have to be strong, you have to do this, you have to do that. There is, and we spend a lot of time talking about the accomplishments of Yehoshua, the, the accomplishments of Yehoshua, this is not going to follow that 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 path. And we're going to have a lot of, there's a lot of overlap because they spent, obviously the bulk of Yehoshua as we studied was the division of the land and the conquering of the land. The problem is, is that then what? So, okay, so you win a war or God wins the war for you, however you want to look at it. And now you have the land and then what? So if we look back in the Chumash, we know exactly what the plan is, meaning Hashem told the Jewish people, listen, when you're going to go into the land of Israel, what are one of the things you have to do? So if I ask you, what's one of the main goals uh, when the Jewish people would come into the land of Israel, what they had to accomplish? What is it that they had to do? You're muted, Dolores. I know, we got to get used to that again. And for the people who were there. Right. So what does that mean, conquer? So use a good word, conquer. Some of them they were supposed to kill and some of them they weren't supposed to kill. Okay. Uh, so are, are we supposed to leave them there? Hmm. Like, are we supposed to have this peaceful coexistence and this kumbaya, can we all just get along and... You know, you do you, and I'll do me, and yeah. So I'll I'll read you a uh, I'll I'll read you a passage in Parshas Mishpatim. In Parshas Mishpatim, this, this is I had a child born in Parshas Mishpatim. They always say that you find your uh, they say you look in, in the parsha for your children's names, like the week that we're born. So somebody, this was our was our fourth daughter was born in Parshas Mishpatim. And they said, oh, the only name that appears in Parshas Mishpatim is Mechashefa. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah, not very nice. My Yoshi, isn't, she's so sweet. Um, anyway, <laughs> the, the Pasuk says, after talking about the Yom Tovim, which we read at some point over Cholomoed on, on Pesach, and the promise is, I'll just read you the, the sidebar, the promise of Swiss, swift passage to and conquest of the land. Okay, when I say swift passage, I'm not talking about uh, Taylor Swift concert. I'm talking about swift passage. So it says, Well, actually, let me let me let me take it back. Hashem says, He says, Look, I'm gonna send a malach, I'm sending an angel in front of me to guard you and to take you to the land that I have prepared. He shamer mi panov, ushma bekolo al tamerbo, kilo yisala pishechem kishemi bekirbo. Hashem says, you have to listen to my voice, don't rebel, because Hashem is not going to forgive your willful sin because of my name. If you hearken to his voice and you carry out that well, everything that I speak, then I will be the enemy of your enemies and I will persecute your persecutors. In other words, if you do the right thing, Hashem has your back. Hashem is going to cover you. Why? Because it says, My angel will go before you, he'll bring the all those nations, etc. And I will hichativ means that I will I will annihilate them. Hashem's gonna destroy them. And then it says, not as it just matzevo say him. Here's where we see many, many times the warning is given. Don't bow down to their gods. Don't worship them. Do not act according to their practices. Rather, you shall tear apart and you shall smash their pillars. So it's not enough to just defeat the people. You have to get rid of every vestige of their 
you want to call it religion, you want to call it culture, or you want to call it their existence, we have to completely eradicate. And this is not, this is just one of many times that this uh, directive is given. You'll worship Hashem and He'll bless your bread and your water. He will remove illness from your midst. There'll be no woman who loses her young or is infertile in your land. I will, I will fill the number of your days. And here, look at this. I will send my fear before you. I will confound the entire people among whom you shall come. I will make all your enemies turn back of the neck of you. I will send the hornets swarm before you. I will drive away the Chivites, the Canaanites, and the Chittites before you. So Hashem says, I'm, I'm going to take care of everything. And by the way, and we saw that in Zephyr Yeshua. Hashem fought their battles. He said, just do what I tell you. Follow the directive and go. But look at this Pasuk. It says, Lo echas, It's not going to happen in a single year. I'm not going to drive them away in a single year because we don't want the land to become desolate and the wildlife of the field to multiply against you. Rather, ma'at ma'at agar tifre Little by little, I will drive them away from you until you become fruitful and make the land your heritage. I will set your border from the Yamsuf, the Sea of Reeds, to the Sea of the Plishtim, and from the wilderness until the river. Oh, here you have it, from the river to the sea. Um, for I will deliver, I will, I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hands, and you'll drive them away from before you. And you should not steal any covenants with their gods again. So after saying, if you listen, and then he says, however, don't lo don't make a covenant with them or with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they cause you to sin against me, that you worship their gods, for it will be a trap for you. So here we have it. By the way, this is not in Devarim. This is not like Erev, we're going into the land of Israel. This is in Parsha Shemos, in, in Sefer Shemos, in Parsha Mishpatim, okay, right after the Ten Commandments. So already in year one and year two in the Midbar, they're hearing these exhortations against Listen, you're going to go, and by the way, at this point, it's not decreed that they're going to be there for 40 years. That doesn't happen for a bit. But even so, it'll be a few months, but this is your job. So it's not enough to just listen to God. It's not enough to just conquer them, but you have to make sure that you don't put yourself in a position where you will be worshiping their gods or you will be tempted by their culture, their religious culture, their whole societal influence, whatever it might be. And this is, um, it gives rise to a famous sort of halacha because it says, lo um, sasek You shall not act like the way they act. So we have certain things that we don't do, and they'll say it's called chukos hagoyim, that it's the way of our of of the people that torment us. So certain things we don't do. And it happens to be that sometimes non-Jews pick up practices that are actually ours and they co-opt them. And because it became so popular with non-Jews that we don't do it. All right. So if you could think of an example, what's an example of something that we don't do because non-Jews do it? Like Halloween. Well, I know there are certain Rabbanim who feel strongly about not getting married in a shul. Is that for that reason? Yeah, I know that when my parent, my, my father, um, uh, David Lifshitz was his Rebbe and he would, he, Duvalker. he went to Israel instead of going to their wedding. So he wouldn't have a reason, but he wouldn't do it because they got married at Avis Torah in Englewood. He wouldn't come into a shul to. Right. So there's a, there's a, the Ramosha Feinstein is famous shuvas about that. Um, that's part of, part of the reservation also is that because things should only be in the shul should only be sanctified matters. Mm. Same as like you can't have a you can't have a meal in the shul. Um, you can't have a you know a mommy and me in the shul. It has to be only davening and only learning Torah and that's it. And even a wedding, you would think. So there's different opinions of that. And then there's a whole question about in a conservative or reform synagogue. So in that same shuva, Ramosha says that that certainly and many hold this way. It's not a problem because there's a lack of kedusha. 
So therefore, it's not an issue. Uh, it's more of an issue in an Orthodox shul than not. Okay. Um, hmm. There's, for instance, people have the custom, uh, Vilna Gon writes this in regarding this custom, on Shavuos, people would put out uh, all sorts of greenery in the shul. You ever see that? People do it. They would put it all over the floor, like, you know, to recreate Har Sinai. Uh, however, at certain points in over the years in history, many of the non-Jews would decorate their churches that way. So even though we started the minhag and then they adopted it, but they made it so much more popular. So it looks as if, oh, what we're doing um, is like that. So, so we have that this thing, but whatever it is, is we want to make sure that we have to be insular and insulated. Now, of course, you can get into all sorts of philosophical differences and conversations of living in the modern world of how much should we engage with the outside world or how much should we insulate ourselves from the outside world. And obviously different communities have very different takes on that. And, you know, we in the modern community have a very specific take on that, obviously. But at the same time, we're also very guarded. Uh, we're extremely guarded and perhaps these days more than ever because of, you know, what's what's going on and how much people love us in the world. Um, so there, but he says it, it's not going to take a long time. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to happen little by little. But the fear is there. And the fact that it's reiterated in the end of the Pasuk shows that if you give it too much time or if you relax your guard, guess what's going to happen? So that's going to set the table really for a safer shoftim. Whereas in Yeshua, yeah, everything we'd follow the way of God and Yehoshua conquered, et cetera, et cetera. The question is, but now what? What did you do? I, I set the table for you. Here's the plate. What did you do with it? Like, did you did you mess it up or not? So if we'll read carefully in the Pesukim, as we're going to see, a lot of it is, yeah, there's some complimentary, but a lot of it is sort of a scathing rebuke on the perhaps lackadaisical effort of the tribes to not follow exactly that directive that was given in Shmos and in many other places. And it starts off, some of the psalm will say, and this is what they didn't do. And also, as we mentioned last week, that whereas in Sefer Yehoshua, everything was a national unified effort, here it becomes very singular of the tribes did this, this tribe did that. All right, so now let, with that, let's look into the text. And the, the first Pasuk even sort of sets you up for it because it says, Vayhi acharei mos Yehoshua, it happened after the death of Yehoshua. So how did Sefer Yehoshua start? If you happen to have that in front of you, and if not, I'll read it to you. The Sefer Yehoshua started, So the, the text wants to draw your attention to that, except telling you this is kind of where the similarity ends. Yehoshua is a great follow-up to the ending of Devarim, Yehoshua was a great leader to follow up Moshe. Who's the leader to follow up Yehoshua? That's exactly it. We don't have anybody. There's no one person that's named to do that. And here it says, what happens? B'nai Yisrael v'yishalu b'nai Yisrael b'Hashem le'mor. The children of Israel, they're inquired of Hashem. And they said, who's going to go up for us first against the Canaanites to, war, to wage war? In Sefer Yehoshua, they never asked, although I'm sure he did. And by the way, how, how did they have to, how did they ask, if they had to ask something about Hashem, they would use what was known as the Urim Vitumim. They would use the thing, you know, it was the original Ouija board. Remember that Ouija board, like those movies that like would scare you, like people would swear that it's real. I mean, it's got to be real, obviously. But um, the, <laughs> they obviously stole that from the from us. Okay. Um, if you look in Raiders of the Lost Ark, it's a very, very good rendition of the Urim Vitumim and the plate and the weirds that the guy that Cohen Guttel wears. It's, it's very good. But the the they would ask, I'm sure Yehoshua did, but most of the time it was Hashem communicating with Yehoshua. And Hashem telling Yehoshua, that doesn't happen here. Here, the people are so lost is that they are now asking, they're asking Hashem. Yehoshua's gone. We have to ask Hashem, wait a minute. Mi yal elonu, el ha-kanani. Who is going to go up for us first against the Canaanite to go do war? Vayomer Yehoshua, sorry, Vayomer Hashem, Pasuk Beis, Yehuda Yale. And here you have that great uh, model of leadership, even though Hashem said it's Yehuda, but Yehuda is the one that is the leader of Israel. All the kings, well, not all the kings as we saw last week, but the, the line of kings should come from Yehuda. That already comes from the end of Parshas Vayichi, Lo Yasser Shevet Mi Yehuda. And 
it's important to note as we are now in the partials of Bereshus, and even though we're still with Avraham and Sarah and Yitzchak, before you know it, it's Yosef and his brothers, but it's Yehuda who has contrition, it's Yehuda who assumes the mantle of leadership, that when Yehuda, when Yehuda speaks, people listen, he's the original E.F. Hutton, and Yehuda, they follow what he says, all the brothers, uh, whereas Reuven, Reuven tries so hard, so, so hard, Nebuch Reuven, uh, you know all my analogies of Reuven, but Reuven tries so hard, but he's not the leader, it's Yehuda. So Hashem says, it's Yehuda's going to go up. And what does it say? I have given the land into his hand. Yehuda says to Shimon, his brother, no, obviously it's not Yehuda saying it to Shimon because they are no longer alive. So we have to, we have to fully, fully understand that. Um, the tribe of Yehuda, the leadership of Yehuda, and he calls Shimon. Now, why do you think he calls Shimon? It's like a little bit of a review of like well how we finished Yehoshua. So I expect uh, Vivian to answer since she was so stark in Yehoshua. <laughs> see, I could pick on you even when I can't see you. I know. He it's was relentless. He, had, he was next door to them. Yes. Well, you, as my Rebbe in seventh grade would say, you're saying good, say better. <laughs> <laughs> So if if we go again, all, all this ties back to Sefer Bereshis. Sefer Bereshis is the blueprint of everything. We say Masa Avosim on the bottom. It is the blueprint for everything. That's why it's so important to dive in and dig into Sefer Bereshis. Um, what was the ending of Shimon in Sefer Bereshis, and then ultimately in the end of Chumash? Didn't go well. He was punished and left with nothing. Correct. Correct. Because of. Um, they killed the, the men in, yes. uh, they killed all the men they killed against the... Dina as revenge for Dina. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. So, so Yaakov Avino on his deathbed, he says, Shimon Levi Achim, right? But they, he's like, these two are, if there wasn't quite a blessing. He's like, yeah, these two are no good together. You know, if you've ever been a teacher in a school. Or if you had to be in a position to, to supervise children, you like, you know, there's certain kids that just can't be together because it's just trouble. So it's basically my son and anyone else. That's that's kind of how, how it goes. Mm -hmm. It's like you have to do recess by yourself. The the Shimon and Levi were told that they have to be separated. Ya Yaakov says it on his deathbed. They have to be separated. Otherwise, they're going to wreak havoc all wherever they go. So but what's interesting to chart the destiny of the two nations is that Levi somehow is able to transcend that curse, blessing, whatever. And Levi becomes Miriam, Aharon, Moshe, Kohanim, Leviim, Pinchas, right? Elazar, Elioha, Navi. So they go like on a very much an upward trajectory. And Shimon, they're decimated in the plague and in the Baal Peor and all that. And Shimon is almost, when we look at the numbers at the end of the Chumash, Shimon is almost down to nothing so that when it comes time for an inheritance, they don't even get their own portion of the land. They become subsumed under the territory of Yehuda. That's why it's a natural request. Yehuda is saying to Shimon, Shimon's like our little, like, uh, our, our little brother here. Yeah, we got to schlep you along also. He's like, okay, Shimon, like we're in this together because we're sort of, neighbors it's not so much that they live next to each other they actually were part of one another so they were together so he says oh, we have to go you have to go up in battle with me for my portion and we're going to wait wage war against kanani and then i will go for you with your portion so it says shimon went with him shimon so yehuda he went and Hashem gave the Kanani and the Prizi in their hands, and they struck them at Bezek, which then became the headquarters for the phone company. And they killed, it says, uh, 10,000 um, 10, men. Again, this is not sweet. This is not loving. This is not nice. This is very, this is ugly. 
And they found Adoni Bezek and Bezek, and they battled against him, and they struck down the Canaanites and the Prezites. Then he runs away. Okay, this is not for the faint of heart. He uh, he ran away, and they chased after him. Right, you have to chase down the leaders. We have to hunt them down, and you have to make them pay. And they cut off his thumbs and his big toes. You can't do a lot without big toes. I don't know this for a fact because I, Baruch Hashem, I have my big toes, but apparently it's very difficult to stand up if you don't have your big toe. Like Sergeant Hulka. Now, if you understand that reference, then I'll give you extra, extra credit bonus points. The Sergeant Hulka big toe reference. You can feel free to write in afterwards. You can search it. You can Google it up, Vivian. Um, so they, they, I'll just read you one of the notes here. Um, well, let's just finish the let's just finish the the this Adoni Bezek. Um, they cut off his bohonos, bohen, because we have it in the Karbanos and Vayikra, Bohen, Yodov, Bohen Raglov, the thumb that they would do it. Vayomer Adoni Bezek Shivim Malachim Bohonos Yedem Raglame Kutzatzim, Hayumalaktim Tacha Shuchoni, Kashar Sisi, Kain Shilam Li Elohim, Vayivu Yushalam Vayamasham. So he says, 70 kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off used to glean under my table. As I did, so God got me back. So they brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. Uh, here we have another reference to Jerusalem, but it's not Jerusalem as we know it, meaning it has it's not it's not famous yet, but it's sort of like a, a precursor. So I'll just read you this interesting note here. His power was demonstrated by his conquest of 70 rival rulers, and his cruelty was apparent in the torture and degradation he posed upon them by cutting off their thumbs and their big toes, forcing them to crawl under his table like dogs, dogs scavenging for food, again, under his table. Achilles Yaakov suggests that the term gleaning under his table may be a figurative expression for subjugation. Rashi comments that Adoni Bezek was not a major king in Canaan since he's not listed among the 31 kings that Yoshua conquered, as we saw in Yosef or Yoshua, even though there were many others, but he was not one of the big players. In no other case do we find Jews mutilating their opponents as they did to Adoni Bezek. Hashem influenced them to do this in order to frighten the remaining Canaanite rulers and to punish Adoni Bezek measure for measure for the atrocities he inflicted on his victims. The history of the Jews proves that they did not take this as a precedent. They didn't treat any other captives this way. So here you want to talk about these arguments about a moral army, this, that, and the other. Here you have it. They didn't kill him because he admitted, in other words, he, he accepted the guilt. And he said, yeah, I did this, so this is why it's happening to me. So they just kind of let him uh, die on his own. Now, what's 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 interesting here is that the author of Sefer Shoftim is beginning with a triumph, with the victory. Here, Hashem said in Sefer Yeshua and throughout the Chumash, this is what you have to do. And the people asked, and Yehuda stepped up, and he did the right thing. He didn't let them live. He didn't let them, if they ran away, they chased after them. You had to completely eradicate your enemy from your midst, particularly the Canaanites, because of their... Uh, of their religious beliefs. And they were so worried because the biggest fear was that we had to get rid of this theology and this ideology from our midst. Otherwise, we're going to fall trapped to it, which, by the way, we see happened a gazillion times. So Hashem understood what he was doing. Now, the passage continues. Um, they waged war against Yerushalayim. And they conquered it and struck it down by the edge of the sword, and they set the city on fire. By the way, the, the Jerusalem, most of it is in, with the exception of the old city area and the Makam and Mikdash, in this territory of Yehuda. I mean, it borders on a few things. On the north of Yerushalayim is Binyamin. Um, when you leave, like if you leave Jerusalem, if you're going to go up Route 60 towards uh, to Psagot Winery, let's say, okay, then you'll see the sign. It's called Binyamin. That has the bin, it has the 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 sign of the wolf. Because it's Binyamin Ze'ev Yitraf, so that's the each region. And when you go up towards Tel Aviv, and you see you're in the you're in the mountains of Judah, you're in the Hare Yehuda. And then as you go in different parts of Israel, that so it's reflected. If you're on the if you're in the you know, I don't know if you want to hang out there today, but if you're like in Akko Haifa area, then uh, it says you know it's called Zvulun. So again, so obviously they they I love how the modern state reflects the biblical nature of it. Um, the so they go then they. Burn the city, and afterwards, 
They descended to wage war against the Canaanites who were in the mountain in the south in the lowland. Again, everything coming back sort of full circle. We learn about them in the Chumash, of course, not this week, but next week we have Hebron with Kiryat Arba and, of course, Chai Sarah. So they went to, uh, they went against the Canaanites who were in Hebron. And again, it was, had been called Kiryat Arba. It always, this, the, the Tanakh always goes out of its way to emphasize that Kiryat Arba and Hebron, it, yeah, it's that one. That's that's kind of what it's saying. He went to, they went to go to Hebron. Oh, yeah, by the way, yes, yes, that Hebron. It's still ours. Don't let anybody else tell you differently. And they they killed Sheshai, Achim, and Talmai, those names which we've heard a million times. And then they went to fight against the inhabitants of Devir, and it was in Kirat Sefer. By the way, many of these conquests we saw already in Sefer Yehoshua. This is not new per se. A lot of them, and they're out of order, but it's part of the context here of saying, yeah, they did it right. The tribe of Yehuda, together with Shimon, they did the conquest right like Hashem had wanted and like Yehoshua had wanted. So they went now to Kirat Sefer, Kirat Sefer, which is, uh, it's like a big Kolel town now, it's, you know, near uh, near Modin kind of. Vayomer Kalev Asher Yakes Kirat Sefer L'chada V'nasati Lo Asachsa B'ti Isha. And Kalev um, said, whoever kills Kiryat Sefer and conquers it, I will give him my daughter Achsa as a wife. Like a little inspiration. That's always good. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. So who did it? Asniel ben Kanaz. And his younger brother, he married and gave his daughter Achash as a wife. So um, that they did that kind of thing then. You know, you marry close relatives. It's allowed. And um, so if you look, for, if, for instance, if I would refer you to uh, back in Yehoshua, just to just, I'm, I'm just going to read you how it's written in Yehoshua. It's in the 15th chapter of Yehoshua. And it says, To Kalev ben Yefuna, he gave a portion among the children of Yehuda in accordance with Hashem's words to Joshua, Kiryat Arba, and Hebron. He drove out the three sons of Anak from there, Sheshai, Achiman, and Talmai, the offspring of the Anak, of the giant. He ascended from there to the inhabitants of Devir. The former name of Devir was Kiryat Sefer. Kalev said, whoever smites Kiryat Sefer and conquers it, I'll give him my daughter Achsa as a wife. Asniel ben Kanaz, the brother of Kalev, conquered it, so he gave him his daughter. When she came, she urged him to let her ask her father for a field, that whole thing with the with the field. But here it's a here it's it's in a there it's just sort of matter of fact and they conquer. But here it's this is after the request. Who's gonna get rid of the Canaanites? Yeah, we conquered the land, but not only that, but we got rid of them as well. We really left no remnants. Okay. So um but the so again, this is also as reported in the 15th chapter of Yehoshua, that when she came to Asnil, she urged, she asked her father, like, can I have a field? She slid off the donkey and he says, what do you wish? And she says, give me a source of blessing. You've given me a dry land. Give me springs of water. So he gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. Okay, so that, but the the Sefer starts off with a very positive report of what happened. Uh, I'll just read you somebody in one of the modern commentaries from Rabbi Hatton. Um, this is a great, <laughs> I just thought this was really interesting. Um because the, he's writing about how the land is, when when we start this Sefer, yeah, the Jewish people are there, but it's not com- fully conquered. You could be conquered and not conquered. You could be there, but it doesn't mean that you necessarily have full control. We may illustrate the distinction between military versus effective and permanent possession with a modern, if somewhat imperfect, example. Six-Day War of June of 1967. The beleaguered and outgunned state of Israel achieved a crushing victory over its powerful Arab foes who had initiated the conflict with the express goal of destroying it. Even as Egypt massed its forces in the Sinai Peninsula and closed the Straits of Tehran to Israeli shipping, a cost of spelling by any objective definition, Israel waited for clarifications from the superpowers. Okay, we obviously, we know the story. Uh, as the drums of war beat ever more feverishly in Arab capitals, Israel launched a surprise attack on the enemy airfields and destroyed their jets on the ground. Syrian forces were repelled from the Golan Heights 
and the Jordanian legions were forced to relinquish the ancient city of Jerusalem. By the end of the war, Israel had not only defeated the military alliance consisting of Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and their allies, but had also succeeded in conquering large tracts of enemy territory that had not been assigned to it according to the partition plan of 1947. So now we have like a whole new problem. If you want to, uh, uh, Michael Goodman's book, Catch 67, is it's a phenomenal book, kind of just outlying exactly what that caused and what we're left with today. In the aftermath of the war, the Arab world convened at Khartoum to unequivocally reject Israeli overtures to return the conquered territories in exchange for peace, which the three knows, you remember the Khartoum, the three knows, which then, of course, is part of the Abraham Accords, that we see Sudan as part of the Abraham Accords, and part of them, like, it's just funny, you know, because never is not never, really. Uh, and so the land remained in Israeli hands. However, the state of Israel hesitated to formally annex it, so that acquisition of land was never followed up by a determined program of possession, and hence was never completed. As a result, decades after that conflict, the state of Israel still finds itself in the precarious and unenviable position of attempting to secure its borders with no foreseeable end in sight. While we may continue to debate the merits of that war and its consequences, for our purposes, one point is clear. Even an astounding military victory is not sufficient to guarantee possession of territory unless victories on the battlefield are resolutely followed by settlement. Mm. Yeah. Again, this is not not political. I'm not I'm not trying to I'm not trying to take but I'm just but but the reality is there. The reality is that we have this shellant of a mess that we're still dealing with Al Hayom Hazel until right this very second. And it's obviously, you know, if we read this a year, you know, a year and a half ago versus now, it would have even a different meaning. But that's uh that's 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 this. Is that when you you have a job, you have to finish it, you have to do it. Um there is Obviously, very, very different, differing opinions today in terms of in the Israeli establishment on how to go about finishing or what, like, what are we supposed to do? And, you know, I'm just saying is I don't want to be sitting in any of those chairs. I have to make those decisions because those are just uh, impossible decisions. Um, but there is a, I, I just found out this week. I'm going to go see it in a couple of weeks. I'm going to I'm going to be in Israel for uh, for Thanksgiving. I heard that very good Black Friday sales in Israel. So I'm going. But <laughs> the. um there is something called a uh, near cinema city. So if if you've been really the entrance to Yerushalayim is the landscape to the entrance of Yerushalayim is changing dramatically. Uh, then there's a tunnel that goes underneath Binyan Ehuma now on the road, and they're trying to make this huge. They're building. It's taking a few years, but they're building a huge pedestrian mall to the entrance of the city. And now when you drive into the city, like most of the time, you're not even going into the center. You're going either to the south or to the north part because of all the roads they built. It's beautiful, but um, in Cinema City, which is not far from that Knisala ear, then there is a, a full-time tent set up. Now it's indoors because of the weather, but they have about 400 or some odd families. Um, I'll tell you, I'm going to just tell you what it's called. It's called, hold on, I have it right here. Do, 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 Just because I got connected with the family that's doing this. Yeah. The um, it's it's the Hagvura, the Forum Hagvura, it's called. And this is they set up that they just gather and they have regular talks, shiurim, even davening. They did slichas there, but these are three, four hundred families who have lost sons in the war and their mission is to tell the government or tell whoever's listening like keep going like we have to finish this is a uh this is a this is a righteous battle and we can't just stop otherwise it'll be for nothing um so you, and you see very different opinions so if you go to let's say tents in tel aviv or outside the prime minister's residence you'll see very different um uh ideologies which is part of the struggle of what's going on um, I, I said this over Yantif. I don't know if I mentioned it in the class here, but uh, Geula Cohen, if you remember Geula Cohen, Geula Cohen, she was a journalist, but she was also a member of Knesset, but her, she's the mother of Tzachi Negbi, Tzachi Negbi's mother. And when she was a member of Knesset in 1982, and they asked her, what would you do if your son was kidnapped or something happened in the war? 
And she said, I would stand outside the Knesset and the prime minister's office. I would yell and scream to do whatever you have to do to take my son home. And that's it. And then it goes, and then I would go to work and I would go inside to my colleagues and say, don't listen to those crazy people outside. They don't know what they're talking about. And mm -hmm. that, to me, to my mind, encapsulates exactly that struggle that we have, that we're going. But part of it is because we have an unfinished job. If we have an unfinished job, then you're going to just get into all kinds of, so whether it's modern day or, but here, that's what Sefer Shoftim is about. If the, and the, we're starting off with, with a good story, Yehuda does it, but guess what? It's not going to continue that way. And that's going to run into all these mini stories. So the Pesukim continue. Um, Tez Zion. Uvenei keni chosein Moshe alu me'irat tamarim es b'nei Yehuda midbar Yehuda asher b'negev arad v'yolech v'yeshev es'am. And the children of Canaanite, Moshe's father-in-law, remember Yisro had a lot of, uh, different names, uh, but his father was Yisro, and that's where he's from. They went from the city of the Date Palms, Ir Hatmarim, which is found in the Chumash as well, and they went with the children of Judah to the wilderness of Yehuda, which is in the south of Arad. They went and they settled with the people. And they went with his brother Shimon, they struck down the Canaanite who was in Zafat. It's not Zafat up north, it's a different one, and they destroyed it. He called it the city Charma. And then, um, is from, from Hashem's mouth to God's ears, right? Here, then, Yehuda, they conquered Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ekron, and all of its territories. These are the inhabitants where the Plishtim were. We'll see them later on. They're going to come back and be a pain in our tuchas later on. Hashem was with Yehuda and he drew out the inhabitants of the mountains, but the inhabitants of the valley could not be driven out because they had iron chariots. And they granted Hebron to Kalev, like Moshe said, and he drove out the three sons of the giants from there. And the uh, But the children of Binyamin did not drive out the Yevusim, the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So they were there with the children of Binyamin in Jerusalem until this day. So there you see now we switch from full conquering to, okay, maybe we didn't conquer you or maybe we got enough, but you guys can stay. So there's that whole, like, is there going to be coexistence? Are we going to have tolerance? Are we going to kind of look the other way? So the, the Torah seems to make it very clear about what should or, or should not have been done. Yoshua seems to be the model, and now we're going to kind of switch gears and say, like, well, maybe this is what should not have been done. It's a foreshadowing also, because the Yavusites, and later on with, with acquiring uh, uh, the hilltop and from the Yavusites, they're going to be the Makam HaMikdash, fine. Um, Chaf Beis, 22. Vaya'alu Beis Yosef Kam Heim Beis El, Vashem Imam. And the, the house of Yosef went up to Beit El, and Hashem was with them. Vaya'atiru B'neit Yosef Beis El, Vashem Eir Lefanim Luz. Okay, this is all the stuff that's coming up in the Chumash now, in these parashas. Fu'ulam Luz Shem Ha'ir L'Rishona. That Yaakov went to Luz. And you know what kind of people lived in Luz, right? Losers. The I, I, I didn't make that up. The They spied out Beit El, and the name of the city had been Luz. The, lo the lookouts, they saw a man leaving the city, and they said, show us the approach to the city, and we'll deal kindly with you. So he shows them the approach of the city. They struck down the city by the edge of the sword. He gave them some good intelligence. And then they uh, they released the man and his entire family, similar to the story of Rachel, perhaps. And they went to the land of the Chittites and they built a city in Luz. He moved it. Okay. Now, that's kind of, okay, that's Yehoshua. I'm sorry, that's Yosef. Now we're going to go to Menashe. And look how it starts off, Pasuk of Zion. And here you're going to have, it's very important, because it, it, could, it could easily be very boring. It's a lot of names of places and cities, by the way, much of which we have seen before already in Sefer Yeshua. But look how it starts off, Chav Zion. Velo horish menashe espesha on vespinoseh. Ve'estan chav vespinoseh. Ve'esyoshvei dor vespinoseh. Ve'esyoshvei vilam vespinoseh. Ve'esyoshvei megido vespinoseh. Ve'yo alaknani l'ashe vesperetazos. Menashe did not drive out the inhabitants of, guess what? Beit She'an, Ta'anach, Dor, Ivlim, Megiddo. Megiddo, we know. Megiddo, Har Megiddo, that's where they get the word Armageddon from. Um, Armageddon is from Har Megiddo. And guess what? 
Vayoel Haknani Lashavas Beretzazos. The Canaanites were determined to dwell in this land. They were not successful in being driven out by Menashe. Vayhiki Chazak Israel, Vayasim Haknani Lamas. So when Israel was strong, what did they do? They imposed taxes upon them or tribute, Vahorish Lahorishu, but they didn't drive him out. So here you go, second approach. Okay, I can't, I, I, I don't know if I don't have the wherewithal or I don't have the drive, I don't have the desire, I don't have the kishkis for it, whatever it is. Okay, Kananim, we're in control. You pay us tax. Use the word tribute, Lamas, Mas is tax, right? You pay us tax, but we not, you could stay here. So a modern day person might, oh, that's great, wonderful, right? No harm, no foul. They know who's in charge. They know who they're paying the taxes to. No, no, no. Because what happens is that they're going to wait. They're just going to wait. They're going to wait. They're going to wait. They're going to wait. And what happens is, is that what we're worried about is not so much what's happening right now, but what's going to happen over time. Over time, you're going to bow down to their gods. And you're going to, you know, soon you're going to start fraternizing. And then you're going to start intermarrying. And they're gonna, uh, on and on and on and on. That's exactly the worry, which is still the worry today of how much we engage with the outside world. That's the same kind of struggle. And look at the next pasuk, Chavtes, Ephraim. So that was Menashe. Ephraim, Lo Horish Es Aknani Ayoshe Begazer. Vayesh Aknani Bekir Begazer. Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites that was in Gezer. So they were in their midst in Gezer. And it keeps going. Zvulun, Lo Horish Es Yosh Vekitron, Ves Yosh Venahalal. Vayesh Aknani Bekir Bo Vayu Lamas. And Zvulun does not pull, does not kick them out. And they, they did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron, Nahalal. And they become taxpayers. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I'm just a little bit confused. This seems very separatist. It kind of feels like, uh, you know, federal versus state laws or something in terms of everybody on their own making their own. I don't know if this is a characterization of each of the shvatim or the reasons of this one is driving out, this one is not. It just seems very decentralized, which might be the beginning of the whole problem of this period to come in general. But I just, I'm curious how, the, I understand that, you know, Yoshua dies, who's going to be in charge? And he says, okay, it's going to be Yehud, and Yehud then goes ahead and asks Shimon for help. But then it kind of just seems like it fractures out from there. Right, and so that's, get, I, 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 right, you weren't here last week. Um, that I'll listen to the recording. I'm sorry, I was in Israel. It didn't work out timing wise. No problem. It's you can still listen to it after I answer the question because then you won't need to. But no, no. But that's exactly the point. That is exactly the point. This is this whole sefer, while it looks similar to Yehoshua, is so much in contradistinction to Yehoshua, where there was central national uh, activity, and here it's tribal. It's completely tribal. And already here, oh, Yehuda, good. Shimon and Yehuda, good. Yosef, pretty good. Everybody else, not so good. Not good. And that sets the table, which the very end of the Sefer, of course, is the Civil War mm -hmm. after Pelagish Begiba. So that's exactly the point. Is like you could have a homeland, you could have the conquering, but now you have states. And if they don't talk to one another, if they don't have anything to do with one another, there's no un there's no real unity. This is what you have left. And then, especially if you leave the Canaanites. So they're, they're dealing with the first, first first thing first, which is you had to make sure that you got rid of the Canaanites, and it's not happening. Asher doesn't do it, and he didn't do Yoshe Ako. It's Tidon, Achlav, Achzib, Chelba, Afik, Rechov. But Yeshiva, Sheri, Bekerva, Kanan, Yoshev, Ratz, Kilo, Harisho. Asher's there. They didn't all those places up north and, you know, on the coastal line. Naftali, Lo Harish. Es Yoshe Be Shemesh, Yoshe Be Sanov, by Yeshe Be Keres Akanat, Be Kerva Kanani, Yoshe Arts, Yoshe Be Shemesh, Ubeis Anas, Hayulahem Lamas. By Yachatsu Maris Bene Don Hahara, Kilona Sanol Rez Lamek, by Yoel Amrila Shevis Bahar Keres, by Alon of Shalvim, by Tichbad Yad Be Yosef, by Yulamas, Gvu Hemori, Mimale Krabim Hasela, Va Mala. So what happens? Naftali doesn't drive out Be Shemesh. I just, it, it makes me so happy just to hear the names of the places. Yeah. As, you know, when you go there today and the Amorites, uh, they forced the children of Don up the mountain because they didn't let them go in the valley. So this is even worse. Like not only did they not conquer them, but they actually got pushed away from their own place. And the Amorite wanted to dwell in Harharis and Ayalon and Shalvim. OK, we know that the Ayalon, you go the Nof Ayalon. Yeah. Shalvim. OK, by the hand of the house of Yosef prevailed. So the Amorite became a tributary. The border of the Amorite was from Maliak Rabim from the rock upward. So this is what happened. This is so this is chapter one. 
is a lot different than chapter one of Yoshua, the first chapter, where that's all like, yes, let's follow the ways of Moshe, and Yoshua is a leader just like Moshe, and we could do this, we got this, we're going to do it. And here it's like, okay, you're doing great. Oh, except for you, 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 and you, you blew it, you blew it, you blew it. So it's it's going to be no secret then, and you should feel about like what's coming. So what? then I guess the other, I guess the follow-up question I have, and I really will listen because I know that you did an introductory last week, is, but it's not, it's not split. It's not like some did and some didn't. It's that two did and no one else did. Yeah. That's, What's that's the reason, what do you think the reason is for that? Like, I would have expected it to be a little bit more split, I guess. Hard to say. I mean, maybe that's the leadership of Yehuda. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, notice is also like not, no names yeah it's usually the tribe names there's no because uh, which shows you also indicating no leadership no which then gets us into the story of shoftim why the, the leadership was in the form of shoftim and then we realize that later on we need a much stronger leadership because the shoftim also um they were meant while well, while they were meant to be sort of peacekeepers and adjudicators they end up having to be de facto these leaders but were they really equipped for that? So that's, and a lot of them were, were pretty good. And, and we come out, of course, that there are 13 Shoftim, even though there are a lot more, but 13 that we announced because of the um, uh, the 13 tribes. It's 12 tribes, but of course we split um, uh, Menashe and Yosef. So that's uh, that's it. So it's a heck of a, a heck of a first chapter of uh, of what what happens. So then that's so then we're going to get into because this sets the table. Now we're going to get actually into the judges and why they were needed. So we'll we'll leave this here. Um, Can I just okay. say one thing. Sure. Um, in the first, two things. In the first pasuk of the chapter, um, we kind of have a hint about how it's all going to be separate and it's not going to be uh, a, a major. Uh, conquest for the whole nation because they asked they even knew at that point right. right and and i and i think also it's a it's a play on the words um i'm glad you brought that up because in um in the end of of the chumash when we kind of do the get to the closing, the, when Moshe is in his final speech, and he, some say he's talking about tshuva or he's not, but he talks about how everybody could access Torah. The famous lines, Ki mitzvah mitzvah olam This mitzvah, whether it's tshuva, whether it's Torah, whatever it might be, the Rishonim disagree, but don't think that it's not it's unattainable or unreachable for you. Luba shemaimi, it's not up in the heavens lay more that you should be saying mi yale lanu hashamaima again that's the exact same phrase mi yale lanu alaknani mi yale it shouldn't be that oh who can extend the heaven for us to take it for us so that we should be able to listen it's not on the other side of the of the river i think i think my my when i read this pasuk here and shoft him that draws me back to parashas nitzavim when hashem saying no no mi yale what are you asking me mi yale it's in your hands you have you have the instructions. You have the guidebook. You know what to do. So what are you all of a sudden asking? Like, oh, who's going to take us there? You know what to do, right? It's like when when the Jewish people are standing at the sea and Moshe cries to Hashem. He says, My, Hashem says, Mati like What do you loves him gain? Go, the bear El Israel you so. It's a time for asking questions, but you know you have the toolbox. You know exactly what to do. I find that to be very similar. That's an excellent. That's an excellent point. What was your second point? I didn't have a second. Oh, point. I thought I wanted you to have a second point. That's really good. Uh, but again, it's, it's a, even a boring, quote unquote, boring text uh, is quite, quite revealing. And we'll see this more as we go along. And then things get a little bit dicey as we go. And we'll see some of these characters. So everybody have a wonderful, wonderful Thank day. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you.